at the time, more than 10% of cancer patients were dying for late diagnosis and or wrong treatment. So cancer is a reflection of the inequalities of the world and the big injustice where good part of the, the poor smoke. I wanted to put the accent on learning rather than teaching. And you can't be a good oncologist if you don't know how to handle the why me question. Hello, everyone. I'm glad to meet you again at Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Our guest today is Dr. Alberto Costa, CEO of uh, European School of Oncology. Uh, Dr. Costa, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and welcome to our interview series. The first question, Dr. Costa, as uh, CEO and for our audience that don't know much about European School of Oncology, I will uh, kindly ask you to share briefly the history of uh, ESO in terms of uh, missions and visions and beliefs, if you can, uh, I would like to, to do this. Um, first of all, thank you for inviting me. I'm always very happy because the European School of Oncology has been a very important part of my life. I am now in the phase in which I need a successor, so <laughs> I'm very happy to tell the story, hoping that someone will uh, take over and understanding the importance of our mission. And usually when I, when I try to explain our mission, I prefer to tell the story on how we were born in the early 80s. I was Working in Milan, I was lucky to be at the right place at the right time. My mentor was Professor Veronesi, who is the uh, surgeon, the breast cancer surgeon who started conservative surgery. And he was at that time very, very well known in my country, in Italy. And uh, we were called, I was accompanying him to do a visit to a very important and wealthy uh, man in Milan who was complaining for bone pain for years and his doctors were treating him for arthritis and nobody thought that could have been metastatic prostate cancer. The man was nearly 90, so it should have come. And this is the beginning of the story. When everything was clear, we, we clarified the treatment, we did help him, and he said, I want to leave my wealth, I have no children, no heirs, so I'm very happy to leave my wealth to a project. Uh, my problem was not the lack of research, my problem was the lack of education. The fact that my doctors, my nurses um, didn't think of the option of a prostate cancer. So I would like, and we went to explore and we realized at the time more than 10% of cancer patients were dying for late diagnosis and or wrong treatment. So not for the lack of research, but for the lack of education. And this is it. That's our story. He left us the money, which is why we are independent. We have no sponsors. And we can every year develop a plan of courses, fellowship, uh, certificate of advanced studies, and everything you can find in our website, which is to improve the knowledge and the skills of doctors and nurses and other professionals, including psychologists and including other <coughs> specialties, to improve the performance with cancer patients. Uh, you said that uh, you begin at the early 80s. Now it's all, almost uh, 40. Uh, 40. More than 40 years. More than 40 years. Uh, I, will, I would like to ask you because nowadays, during this time, the technology evolved, the research, uh, inclusive the education uh, evolved very, very much. And I would like to ask you. Uh, it is a debate 
within uh, oncological professionals that uh, cancer is uh, epidemic versus curable disease. What is your opinion, personal opinion as a specialist about this statement? Well, this is not my field. I'm not, I, I was a surgeon and I'm not an epidemiologist, but my experience, my 40 years of clinical experience says that, as everybody knows, first of all, we have more cancer because we live longer. So simply statistically, we have more chance to get cancer because the life expectancy has grown of nearly 10 years in the last 50 years. So that's normal. The second is that the general statistics are influenced by those parts of the world who have, unfortunately, less prevention measure, measure and less um, tools to treat the cancer. So as always, the rich West has learned not to smoke, to eat better, to change the diet, to the, and at the same time, we are those who have the good hospitals, the good drugs, and the good treatment. So cancer is a reflection of the inequalities of the world and the big injustice where good part of the, the poor smoke as we were smoking. I started to smoke when I was in the army. My father was started to smoke because during the war, they didn't have to eat. So they were smoking. So <clears throat> I think at the same time, the development of research has made cancer more a chronic. We see now people with bone metastasis for 10 years, for example, which was unthinkable. When I was an active clinician, the diagnosis of metastasis was the end for the patient. Now it's the norm to have breast cancer patient, prostate cancer patient, even lung cancer. A lung cancer patient with an ALK mutation can live, and I, as a, one is not a secret, the chair of our advisory board, Professor Pavlidi, says openly he has ALK mutated lung cancer cancer and is now five years and he's on treatment and he keeps working. Uh, All these things were unthinkable for us until 10 years ago. Uh, for example, I had an interview with a survivor of uh, pancreatic cancer stage four. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, that uh, means that uh, it, it depends more on, uh, on us than, uh, uh, let's say, other, uh, on, for example, technology. It's well, you well, man, I think it depends a lot. What you mentioned is technology because the mutation, the genetic approach has changed a lot. So if you have the mutation, you can survive. If you don't have it, you don't. I don't know. Exactly. Actually, this is one yes. of the problems because so many patients say, but why? I, I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, I did physical exercise and now I have I don't know leukemia for example or as you say pancreatic cancer so <clears throat> still the serendipity and the random chance in life exist a lot but uh, uh, the SO main vision remains patient first this is the absolutely yeah absolutely because uh, we mention mention uh, before the, the interview, the European Cancer Organization, and uh, uh, they are working uh, intensively this year uh, and uh, during the mandate of uh, uh, Chaba um, on inequality in cancer care. Sure. Uh, what do you uh, think it's the field where we can feel this inequality? Uh, I had an interview, for example, with a psychologist in the U.S., and uh, they say that the first inequality came in the options that the patients have on the, its own resources. So if you have good resources, then you can have a good uh, cancer care. If you don't, you don't have. 
What do you think about this? It's like education. If you can, you have resources, you can send your children to the best schools. If you don't have, your children will not go to school. And health is the same. That's why it's a general problem um, on the inequalities of the world, and particularly in Europe. Don't forget, we are very fond of the fact we are European School of Oncology. Nothing against the rest of the world, but we do not do any activities in Australia, in Africa, in China. We are focused on Europe. <clears throat> this was the will of the donor, of, of our uh, endowment uh, giver. Um, and that's why also we have focused since the beginning our activity on the inequalities between West and Eastern Europe. We have been the first investing a lot because... Unfortunately, I know. I come from, as you know, from the Eastern Europe, so it's a huge uh, gap between Western Europe, Eastern Europe, in terms of access to cancer care or access to, go to good cancer care because... Good cancer care. You have cancer care, but you don't have good cancer care. So this is... Uh, uh, let's say a thin uh, difference, but very, very important because uh, it's not uh, enough to have access. It's enough to have good and uh, uh, performant access to cancer care. So uh, technology in this case and also in Europe counts a lot. Yeah. Uh, but also education to put the patient at the center, because this was not, again, paradoxically, you can have a more liberal and more philosophical and more holistic approach in the rich countries than in the poor. Because when the cake is small, everybody wants a slide and with no discussion. Yeah. It's a luxury <clears throat> Unfortunately, you you are right. Yes, it's a it's a luxury, and I'm going back to education again because um, nowadays all over the world and also in in uh, Europe uh, there are a lot of debates about how the du education in the field of oncology should look like, and uh, so motto it's learning to care. Yeah. Uh, therefore, how important is lifelong learning principles for uh, oncologists, for doctors, for nurses, to learn all the time? Learning to care was a political choice from our board, and I, I don't want to be... Uh, <clears throat> to... <clears throat> Well, I, 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 I like exceptionally to take the credit for having been the one who proposed this motto because the original motto was, of course, teaching to treat. And this was the difference. I wanted to put the accent on learning rather than teaching because old schools at the time were focusing on teaching. They are focusing, like the hospital were focusing on doctor rather than the patient, the school were focusing on the professor rather than the students. But for us, the most important part was the process of learning. Teaching, we can, ch we can change. We invite constantly. <clears throat> we check our teachers, and we have also question on their the quality of their English, the quality of their empathy in accepting the questions, the quality of their slides, and constantly, we do not re-invite those who have the lowest score. So, the, in some way, the learners it, decide who is the good competition. Teacher. Yeah, and the learner says, "This I learned. This guy was right, and this one may be a great scientist, may be a great clinician, but he is not capable to teach, to transfer." So, the accent is on learning. And the accent is on, on care instead of treat, because treating is a protocol, is a dose of a drug, is a procedure for surgery, but caring is different. Caring is remembering and being fully aware 
that the part of the body that you are treating belongs to a body and this body has a soul and has a life and has a family and has a history. So no, learning more, to care is really our motto. Uh, care is more empathic, to put it this exactly. way. Because exactly. Because as an as a oncologist, the first thing you have to give this uh, field of hope and the feel of uh, surviving and the feel of trust to the patients. And this is care. On, uh, this is care, and you you have to know you you have to know of course the the right drug, the right dose, or the right field of radiotherapy. But you have to know how to answer the the, the question of all the patients, which is why me? As why you me? know, yes. by definition, the cancer patient asks why me. That's the first and foremost the first. question. Yes. Yeah. And you can't be a good oncologist if you don't know how to handle the why me question. That's, and this comes the, the importance also of communications, how to communicate, to, to learn, to care, but also to communicate, because communication is a part of care. So it's like a, a, a circle, to put it uh, this way in... Um, care over uh, through the patients. Uh, you mentioned that ESO it's uh, mainly uh, focused on uh, Europe and uh, European institutions. I would like uh, to ask you if ESO has partnerships outside uh, Europe, uh, for example, with uh, International Psych Oncology Society or uh, World Health Organizations or uh, other NGOs outside Europe, if you have partnerships or collaborations on specific <clears throat> subjects? Yes, we do, but we, we have a, a generous budget every year, but limited. So our job is every year the family of the donors tell us how much we can spend, we prepare a plan, we tell them how, what we would like to do, and we do. And this has been working very well for years. Um, so by definition, we can't do much. And in the past, we were a bit, uh, oh, we can do this, we can do that. We have done, um, for example, a, a special program. We supported the first breast cancer and colorectal cancer screening in Georgia, for example. And we are very proud of that. And we have beautiful links with that country. Or oh, we have done similar thing. Uh, we have done a specific plan in Kyrgyzstan because they didn't even have the knowledge to dose the receptors, the hormone receptors of breast cancer. So we started from scratch and fund. But more and more, we think that this is not our mission. We are not the WHO. We are not, of course, with international societies, we have a link, but mostly with the European offices. For example, SEAL, pediatric, we do a masterclass every two years with them, but with COPE, COP yeah. Europe, because yeah. we can't. Yeah, because <clears throat> we can't do everything. Yeah. And uh, you, ma you mentioned pediatric, which unfortunately nowadays it's like an explosion of new and uh, new cases in uh, pediatric uh, oncology. Now I would like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, also about education and the COVID period. Um, education, as I was a student and uh, I do my education, I'm still doing it. It's better when it's face to face, like going to see, have this uh, empathy with the professor and the professor with the students. What about the period of COVID? How hard was for ESO to move all the courses in online in terms of uh, message that should be received? Well, I must say, we have been lucky in this because COVID came when we were already doing EESO, um, 
for years. We had the original dream of having a kind of a weekly meeting which started more than 10 years ago, every Thursday at six in um, Central European time. So seven in Athens and five in Dublin and 12 in New York. So we had this weekly appointment called the E Grand Round every Thursday, every week on Thursday. And and in some way, this was a kind of anticipation on what then happened with COVID. So we had this, the experience, we had the knowledge, we have the calendar, and we had to expand that way for two years. For the same reason now, we are reducing the activity online a lot and going back to the activity in presence because now another uh, many other people are now doing with the experience of covid they are doing online education so it's not a necessity for us anymore we go back to our core activity which is uh... we, we 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 try to offer we we offer a course for medical students who want to understand whether they could become oncologists and then we have the master class, and then we have the certificate of advanced studies, and then the clinical training centers. We give the fellowship to go practically in a cancer center, including and the center includes. In in addition to these questions, uh, you are returning back, let's say, in the classroom, to put it uh, this way. Uh, yeah. What? Uh, it's uh, your opinion about uh, artificial intelligence uh, in the field, let's say first of oncology, because this is the speciality. In education or in oncology in general? Bo both of them. Which one you you want to mm -hmm. take it first? Which well, in education, I love because I am a very fond promoter and my people will tell you that sometimes I exaggerate, but um, we are finally capable to have more and more better quality <clears throat> simultaneous translation. I think that this story of forcing everybody to speak English has to finish. Everybody has to express himself or herself in his own language, be capable and now, as you see, uh, the artificial intelligence is making very fast and beautiful um, progress in this. I was shocked. Uh, for the first time, I went to a meeting in Athens, and with my cell phone, putting the camera, I was looking at the slides and you have the... in Greek and reading them in Italian. Yeah, not even in English, in Italian, right. in my language. So this as to we are promoting this so much and we dream of doing courses where everybody can follow the course in his own language. And this story of the so-called bad English as official language, uh, I hope it will finish because it's not true. It, it, it has always given an advantage to the mother tongue English speaker mm -hmm. who looked more intelligent, more competent, but they just need <laughs> knew the language better. It was a matter of language. So to me, this, this is it, yeah. artificial intelligence very welcome for the communication in okay. language. And mm -hmm. in oncology, as you know, the the experiments are very nice. The application to screening, for example, breast cancer screening, the computer is probably more capable the single radiologist to find a suspicious lump, a suspicious image, or in dermatology. I remember the famous paper where five German dermatologists were put against the computer and seeing a number of images and saying, is this a melanoma or not? And the computer did better because the computer had 100,000 images stored in the memory, and the human being cannot do it. This is not replacing, of course, but these are welcome 
sh should be treated as a tool. Absolutely, yeah. As a tool. Very yeah. welcome as a tool. As a sure. tool, yes, of yeah. course. Uh, we are uh, now at the, we are approaching the, the final of our interview and I would like to ask you one last question. As, a, let's say, one of the founders of ESO, now the CEO of ESO, how do you think it's going to look ESO in the next decades? Let's say in the next 10 years, with all this artificial intelligence, uh, going back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, learning, uh, inequalities in societies, conflicts, uh, a lot of challenges for, for people, for doctors, for patients. How do you think ESO will, will uh, look like? as an entity, as an institution, within European... I really hope that we will manage to preserve our original mission. I understand we have been lucky because very few people have the chance to have money to do activities without conditions. So. We are super lucky to have no commercial sponsor and we can decide. And people know that when they come to ESO, they can say what they really think because there is no influence whatsoever. And the second, I'm happy observing the translation, the transformation, because the first students are now becoming our teacher. And I remember yes. them as students, now and I see them. It's like with the children. You say, yes. oh, what do you mean you are a professor of oncology in Skopje? Really? You yes. were my student. Yes. And I am. So, um, and the link with the institutes, the key institutes, you know, Europe has made a big effort with the Euro Beating Cancer Plan and yes. Stella Kiriakidis as commissioner, and we see the results. I mentioned Skopje because I was in Skopje recently and they show me that they have a network with the phone and they tell to each other, I say, I have a patient with a sarcoma, what would you do? And they got the answer from Ljubljana, from Rome, from... So technology, well used, will help a lot. And the, the European principle, unity in diversity. Absolutely, bravo. That's... Yes, very good thing. Dr. Costa, thank you very much for having you thank today. You. It was a very, very nice interview and a very, very nice talk uh, about, uh, let's say, life in general, life for caring for people with cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.